Communication matters. That's why we provide automated text and fax outreach within 24 hours from receiving a referral. This level of communication assures our partners and patients that we receive the order. Once the insurance verification process is complete, we contact the patient as soon as possible to schedule an appointment with one of our licensed respiratory therapists. Patients are offered several different ways to learn about their therapy, including Zoom video appointments. To learn more, please visit medicalserviceco.com. Good afternoon and welcome back. At this part of the forum, presentation are split into two separate tracks, one for the sleep discipline and one for the respiratory. You are currently in the sleep track. If you need respiratory credits, now is the time to switch to the respiratory track. This lecture is being provided by Amber Allen, who will be presenting on the rise of school shootings. Could sleep play a role? Ms. Allen has been in the sleep field since 2008 and currently serves as the program director to KHEP, accredited polysomnographic technology program at Collin College in McKinley, Texas. Prior to joining Collin College, she worked as a RPSGT for the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Ms. Allen has spoken at numerous sleep and respiratory care conferences at the international, national, and state level and currently serves on the BRPT Board of Directors as a Director and Chair of the Education and CSTE Committee. We thank Ms. Allen for her willingness to share her knowledge and experience during today's forum. As a reminder, please enter your questions under the Engage tab, and Ms. Allen will answer following her lecture. As mentioned, I'm Amber Allen. I am the director of the Polysomnographic Technology Program at Collin College in McKinney, Texas, and the secretary-elect for the BRPT. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the rise of school shootings and could sleep play a role in that? We've seen an increase in school shootings over the last 20 years, and we've seen a change in teen sleep behaviors in that 20 years as well. So is there a correlation between the two? We shall see in today's presentation. So I'm first going to start talking about the different school shooting statistics and looking at how those statistics line up with what's going on in teen lives and the mindsets of these school shooters. What were the behaviors that were exhibited that led up to the school shootings and what kind of things were they facing? We're also going to discuss the development of the teenage brain because the development really factors into what these teens are taking into their brains and how they're processing that information. We're also going to examine teenage sleep and look at the effects of sleep deprivation and how that impacts the teenage brain. And then we're going to explore sleep behaviors and the school shooters of Columbine because we have to understand from the very first pinnacle um, event what was going on in their brains because that really helps us to understand why these trends continue. We're also going to look at the rise of technology and explain how that's contributing to poor sleep in teenagers because technology really has impacted and changed the way our teens are sleeping these days. And then we're going to examine why sleep de deprivation is under-recognized in the adolescent population and why it may be a contributing factor to school shootings because a lot of the adults that are working with these teenagers really do not understand what sleep deprivation looks like for that population and because they don't recognize what it looks like, they're not able to help these teens. So we're going to start by looking at the number of school shootings since 1998. I really wanted to start with 1998 because that was the year before Columbine. And Columbine really was the catalyst for school shootings. Um, it was the one that is most notorious. When you think of school shootings, you think of Columbine. And it really started this trend. Um, and we look at back in 1998, clear through 2006 was the first that we saw double digits of school shootings. So we had a lot of, with Columbine, we saw a lot of copycats. We saw a lot of teens are like, well, you know, how do I top that? Um, and so you look at, we see a decrease in 2007, but we see an increase that goes all the way beyond that. Even um, we see even more, even in 2020 with COVID-19 and closing of schools than we even did in 2007. Um, so in 2007, keep in mind what was going on in that year. That year was the introduction of the iPhone. 
And with the introduction of the iPhone, we saw a change in the technology for um, smartphones and for consumer electronics. We saw more portable electronics that came about, and we also saw teenagers getting more access to those portable electronics. And so it really changes the dynamic when we look at these spikes, and you'll see that once we got to about 2014, we started to see major spikes there. And actually last year, 2019, was the biggest spike that we saw in school shootings with 51 school shootings. Uh, and it makes you wonder if COVID-19 hadn't happened, what would be our statistics here in 2020? Would we see more or would we see a decrease? Because there's been a steady climb in the number of school shootings since 2017. So you know, is COVID kind of, you know, giving us a little reprieve here? What would have been the statistics had we had kids in school? No one will know, but it's interesting how we see this kind of ebb and flow that occurs in the number of school shootings. So since 1998, there has been 299 different school shootings. Um, of that 299 school shootings, 341 people were dead as a result. So we saw more deaths than we saw actual number of school shootings because we have several school shootings that actually were mass casualties. And just under half of the school shooters were 18 years of age or younger. So we have a high demographic that is not even out of high school that are committing these crimes. What was really interesting to me in the research is that the youngest school shooter was only six years old, which is really tragic to think at six years old that they could do and act like that. But the average age for most of the school shooters was 15 years old. And I want you to keep that number of 15 years old in your mind because we're going to talk later in this presentation about why that's such a key age, especially in teenage brain development. And most of the shooters were male. Um, so there were female school shooters, but really there wasn't the casualty numbers with the female school shooters as there were with the male school shooters. If you look at the school shooters for the, the ones that were the largest number of school uh, of casualties, they were male um, perpetrators. So over 90% of those school shooters were either current or recent students at the school. So they were not somebody that didn't have a tie to that school. They were familiar with that school. They were either going there currently or they just recently left that school. But there was something that triggered them that resulted from that school that led them to commit the act that they did. 68% of the school shooters obtained their weapons from either their personal home or a relative's home. So they had access, and it, in a lot of these cases, it was easy access to these weapons. Um, so they had the means to commit the act. And we'll talk about in an upcoming slide about how these were not random acts. Uh, there was a lot of thought that went into it. So they had time to plan and obtain these uh, weapons as well. So when we look at the mass school shooting since 1998, Thurston High School, Really, the reason why it wasn't as big of a deal so much as Columbine is because it was more injuries than it was deaths. There was only four people that died as a result of that high school, shoes, school shooting and 25 that got injured. Whereas in Columbine, that's where we saw the mass casualty component with Columbine because there was 15 people that died there with 21 injured. And then we kind of had a lull for a while for until about uh, 2005 where we saw another major casualty um, school shooting and that was in Red Lake, Minnesota with 10 dead, seven injured. Um, the largest mass school shooting was at Virginia Tech in 2007 that left 33 dead with 17 injured. Uh, and then we still see a trend there um, that doesn't really die down. We see about every year to two to three years, there's another mass shooting. So Northern Illinois, six dead, 21 injured. Sandy Hook's another one that is very famous as far as school shootings is concerned. That was 28 that died there, two injured. Umpqua um, Community College, 10 dead, nine injured. We heard a lot about Parkland and Santa Fe um, with their number of casualties and injuries. So this is a, a problem that we, we have seen continue every couple years. There's a major, major school shooting. So the means that we've done to try to prevent these hasn't really been working. We still are seeing numbers. And like I said, with COVID, it's hard to say what the numbers might've been 
if that hadn't happened. So the observed school shooter behaviors, this is the things that were noticed by the peers and by the parents, by family members, um, teachers, what they noticed about these school shooters that really kind of identified that they may potentially do something serious is they were noticed as being socially awkward, avoidant, um, isolated. So they really kept to themselves. They did not hang out with their peers. Um, some would call them strange. They, their behaviors were not the norm. Uh, a lot of them retreated into fantasy, so they would like to watch violent video games, uh, watch violent TV shows, movies. Um, they really retreated into that fantasy world so they didn't have to deal with the reality that was facing them. Some of them were obsessive. They had very things that, uh, things that they were very particular about that um, they would just have themselves fixated on. Um, they were fascinated with violence, morbid media, or death. Uh, so they they had that kind of being ingrained into them because they were watching all this stuff that at their age really they shouldn't have been watching. Uh, some have a history of cruelty to animals and what we see is if they exhibit a behavior of cruelty to animals they tend to exhibit more violent behaviors later and we even see that if you look at any kind of documentary on uh, serial killers a lot of times you'll see that there's a history of violence um, and these kids have a sense of hopelessness they don't have a desire to live they don't care what happens to them they want others to feel the pain that they feel Many of them had dysfunctional home lives, so their parents really weren't paying attention to them, or they came from broken homes where they were products of divorce, um, and you know maybe mom or dad was working multiple jobs, not really home. Um, they didn't have good relationships with their siblings, uh, so dysfunctional home life factors in. They also, many of them posted their frustrations and their anger on social media or in recorded videos. Even in the case of Columbine, there is video manifestos by Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold that show what they were planning to do and what their desire was to kill everybody. Uh, and a lot of these school shooters, especially with the high prevalence of social media right now, um, they're posting things about you know, warnings that, you know, hey, you keep picking on me, I'm going to kill you. You know, there's those kind of things that are present there, they can trace back to these shooters. These shooters often were absent from school in the days before the attack. So they just stopped coming for a few days. Everybody's like, you know, they're not, they're not here. They really weren't thinking about them. Um, and nobody questioned the absences. And the prior threats were there. So they've either made prior threats to their peers, they've made prior threats to their families. Um, so there was a history there that wasn't a surprise when uh, things happened. So the interviews that have been conducted with the surviving school shooters, because some of the school shooters actually died in their attacks. They either were self-inflicted or shot out. Um, but the ones that did survive, when they conducted interviews with those school shooters, there was a number of things that were revealed that really gave you insight into what type of person might be a potential school shooter. Um, so the number one thing is that a lot of them were bullied. Um, they were bullied by their peers. So either they were bullied face to face or there was social media bullying. And so with technology, it's really hard for these uh, students to escape from the bullying because it's not like, you know, back in the day where you go home and you get a reprieve from it because you didn't see it on social media. Nowadays, it's on every social media platform. They're being teased. So bullying is very prevalent. They battle depression, and we'll talk a little bit later about why depression, uh, the kind of the, the cycle that goes with depression and sleep and why that's a problem. So a lot of them battle depression. Uh, a lot of them were withdrawn. So they said, you know, I didn't socialize with my peers. I just kind of kept to myself. Um, they just didn't have a desire to live. They either considered or attempted suicide. So, you know, if they weren't successful with the suicide, then, you know, they used that kind of as a fuel to perpetrate their acts. Uh, a lot of them were drinking, doing drugs. So they were trying to escape reality through that. Um, and then we see kind of what they're filtering into their brains by their media choices. Um, a lot of them were listening to songs about killing and dying. Um, they were watching violent movies, TV shows, playing violent video games. So they were 
basically absorbing all of this violent material um, that we'll talk about how that impacts the brain at that age um, and affects their decision-making process. And when they committed the acts, they said the violence made them feel like they have control because with the bullying and everything that they face, like the, the dysfunctional family situations, they didn't have any control over that. And so they felt very hopeless and helpless. And they said when they committed the acts, this violence made them feel like they had control. And then incidents or threats at home were not taken seriously. So uh, even in the history with Dylan Klebold and uh, Eric Harris, they had some little misdemeanor events that had occurred um, that nobody took serious. They had done some robberies. And um, so there was things that, you know, were kind of in place before the act happened that were kind of warning signs. And then the acts were not random. These school shootings didn't, you know, they just didn't come to school one day and say, oh, I, I think I'll go and shoot everybody up. Um, that was not the, the case here. They planned the attacks in advance. They accumulated weapons. They kind of made a game plan of how they were going to execute um, their attacks. So these were not in, you know, that absence time that they had before uh, this, the shootings happened. During that absences from school, they were really honing and finding finalizing those plans because they knew on that day they were going to go in and commit these acts. Um, so it was not random and there's a lot of planning that went into these. So with COVID-19, we saw a decline in school shootings um, from uh, 2019, like I said, was that peak where we hit 51 school shootings. And in 2020, we're down to only seven. So we went from that peak of 51 to some of the lowest numbers that we've seen in nearly a decade. Uh, so most of, of the last decade has been in double digit numbers. Uh, so we, we saw this decline. And with that, you know, Granted, we had the schools were shut down, you know, COVID-19 shut down schools, kids were, you know, doing school from home, but did it really stop the teen violence? Um, the, the big thing is, is with schools not in session, these, these kids did not have access to mass volumes of people. But there was still cases where, you know, a teen went and shot a bully, um, killed a bully. There's but the biggest thing that we saw with COVID-19 is that withdrawal, that depression that was present in these kids, they were turning that violence to self-infliction. Um, and that was an increase in, in youth suicide. So we saw an, a major increase in uh, suicide numbers in this COVID-19 time compared to, I mean, teen suicide's always been a problem uh, in these age groups, even during these, these ebbs and flows of school shootings. Um, but because there's not been you know, necessarily an outlet for some of these. There might have been mass casualties or mass shootings um, in 2020, but just there wasn't the access to the people. So the, the, the violence is still there. It's just in a different capacity. So is the solution gun control? That's been the number one thing that's been posed after all of these mass school shootings. Do we need better gun control laws? Um, so that's what's been proposed by the school officials. That's what's been proposed by government officials, uh, lawmakers. You know, we need to have stricter gun control laws. But really, is that the solution? If we go and look back to Columbine, Columbine is really an interesting case when we look at it in the scope of school shootings, because it was never designed to actually be a school shooting. So it was actually originally planned to be a bombing. So Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold planted all kinds of bombs in the cafeteria. And the plan was to go and detonate all of those bombs during the peak lunch hours um, when everybody would be in the cafeteria. There would be mass casualties as a result and the bombs didn't go off. And so they brought the guns as basically their backup plan that if the bombs didn't go off, they were just going to shoot everybody. Uh, and so with that kind of mentality, they were trying to uh, basically be the most, you know, kill the most people in history kind of thing. They wanted that infamy, infamy on a historical scale. So they wanted to have hundreds of people die that day uh, as a result of their plan. It's just their plan didn't go as planned because um, they even had a bomb in their car um, that was supposed to detonate when emergency services were coming to respond to the shooting. Um, so that bomb was supposed to go off um, to keep people from helping the injured and helping those that had been um, 
hurt by their their act. And so it's interesting with uh, Harris and Klebold uh, because Harris was the the psychopath, the main perpetrator of the plan. But Klebold was more suicidal, so he didn't have a desire to live, and he kind of just followed along with what Eric Harris's plan was and executed it. But Harris was the main uh, planner behind this because he just had this this fascination with killing. Um, so homicide and suicidal thoughts were were prevalent in both of these uh, perpetrators. And so when we look at it, is the solution gun control? Really, it's in this case, it wouldn't have been the solution because it was more of a minds issue versus a means issue. So they had the the intent to inflict the harm, whether they did it with a bomb or whether they did it with a gun, it was still going to happen. Um, so we really have to change teens mindsets rather than take away guns because they're still going to find weapons that they can use to execute um, these these acts. So what drives the shooters? Most of the shooters were described as having addictive behaviors or brain mental illness. So, um, you know, with, with Columbine, those guys were very, very obsessed with these violent video games, violent songs, violent movies and TV. Um, and, or, you know, there's cases in other school shootings where they had kind of a brain or mental illness. And a lot of times that mental illness is actually depression. Um, so we'll talk in an upcoming slide about how depression affects teens. The other thing we have to keep in mind is that at these ages that they're committing these acts, the logic center of the brain is not fully developed in their brains yet. So how are they able to make logical decisions? Um, so when we look at the teenage brain at these ages, it's like an entertainment center that's not been fully hooked up. And think about when you get a new entertainment center, you've got the TV, you've got the speakers, you've got the sound bar, you've got the DVD players, everything that's going to plug into that. There's all these wires and cables that got to be run. Um, and so it's, it's usually a hot mess. And that's kind of how their, their brains are. There's all these different pathways and all these different cables that don't know where they need to go. And so uh, it's, it's a challenge for, for the teens in general. And then you add add these other elements to it and it's kind of this ticking time bomb. So first we have to look at what's going on in the teen brain. They have so many things that they're facing. You've got school, you've got, you know, some of them are working, you've got where they want to have fun with their friends, they're very social beings, um, you know, they, they, they're tired so they're thinking about I want some sleep, um, you know, there's the, the teenage angst or they think, oh, I'm just going to do this later or, um, you know, status updates. What's going on in social media? What's my best friend up to? Uh, that whole self-control thing's not there, you know, so that it's that self-control area that's still under construction. So you've got all these different things that are running through their brain, but you don't have the logic center to kind of organize and, and compile those thoughts and, and make them make good decisions. So when we look at the structure of the teenage brain, we look at first you've got the brainstem, which controls the basic functions. So that's your breathing, that's your heart rate. So it's what keeps you alive. Uh, it runs all the vital structures of the body. And then you have the limbic system, which is the emotional brain. And that's what develops first in teens is the limbic system. So teens are making decisions from the emotional center of the brain. And then the last thing to develop is the cortex, which is the logical brain. And so the cortex doesn't fully develop till about mid-20s. Uh, so you have more of the, the limbic system, the emotional brain that is taking over the decision-making process for teens. So what happens to the teenage brain? Well, the most dramatic growth spurt of the brain occurs during adolescence. So they're having all these things that are developing in the brain that is really structuring them for their adult years. So when we look at the teenage brain, you need to kind of picture a highway. I live in Dallas, Texas, and we have all these highways that you look at them and you're like, how in the world does anybody find their way? Um, how in the world are they structured like that? Because they're all on top of each other. It's just this kind of mishmash. We even have one that's called the Mix Master. You know, you really think about these highways. And what we're seeing is, think about with all these highways that are going on, 
when the teen brain's developing, the information highway is getting a faster speed limit. So think about, you got these highways and they increase the speed limit. So you have more potential for crashes and more potential for things happening. And so this is the myelination process. Now you'll have some routes that'll actually get shut down and that's the pruning process of the brain. So you'll have those uh, routes that are no longer used, no longer of value. So the brain will just prune them and cut them off. Then you'll get some of those routes where you've got information that's happening, but it needs to be rerouted and reconnected to an active pathway. And then you have the old highways connecting to the new highways. So you've got this sprouting. So you've got, you know, this growth of the new highways because it's bringing in things from the past, the old stuff. And think about any time you've gone through road construction. If you've, you know, ever dealt with road construction, you know that it rarely finishes on time. Um, it rarely flows smoothly. You know, you're dealing with weather, whether it's rain, snow, um, you're dealing with other circumstances that happen. And so when you think about the development of the teen brain, it's this major construction project and it's, it's got a lot of hiccups. It's got a lot of issues. And that's why we see all these personality changes in the teens. You know, one minute they might be this happy go lucky and then next it's teenage angst. Um, and it's all these personality changes as they're trying to kind of figure out their pathways and how the brain's trying to figure out their pathways. Um, and so that's why we see all these changes that happen in the teen years. So this is kind of what the teenage brain looks like as you've got all these roads that are going over top of each other, merging with each other, and the brain's just trying to find its way. So in this uh, situation, we have a growth in synapses. And if we use the entertainment center uh, illustration, basically what you're seeing, this equivalent is uh, getting more wires for the entertainment center. So you're going to get rid of the ones that you don't need. Think about any time you've put together a piece of furniture. There's always a couple extra screws that you don't need. So you're going to get rid of them. And so what the brain's doing is it's pruning away those synapses that uh, aren't needed to make room for uh, or to make the remaining ones actually more efficient. And then we get this myelin coating that uh, coats the synapses to protect them after pruning so that way that they are able to grow the way that they're supposed to. But the prefrontal cortex area is actually the last area uh, to be regulated. So it's more immature in teens. So any behaviors that are started at this age are more likely to be maintained because of the synapses being selected based on use. Um, and then the plasticity of the synapses can help teens pick up skills. So this is a great learning time for teens to develop skills and information that they'll need uh, for adults. And a lot of times what we see happening in these years is, is kids are trying to figure out what they want to be when they grow up. They're trying to figure out what college they want to go to, um, what kind of jobs they want to work. Um, so we see a lot of growth that's happening there as they're trying to make these pathways that will shape their adulthood. The uh, prefrontal cortex, if we're going back to the whole entertainment center uh, analogy, think of this as the remote control that controls the brain. Um, so, you know, when you don't have a functioning remote control or you lost the remote control, um, you have more difficulty operating the TV. And so not having this remote is creating more difficulty for the thought process for teens. Um, so what the teens are reverting to because they don't have this developed till their mid-20s is they're actually using the back of the brain for their decision making. So they're making all their decisions based on the emotional center, the limbic system. And uh, adults can use the frontal lobe for their decision making. So that's why they can identify errors in decision making better because they're thinking more with the logic center. So that logic center tells them what's real, what's not real, what's right, what's not right. And so they're able to make decisions based on thought and analysis, whereas teens are making their decisions based purely on how they feel. So if it feels good to them, they're going to do it. They're not going to think about consequences. They're not going to think about the ramifications. They're just going to do what feels good. 
Uh, the nucleus accumbens is well developed though in teens, and this is the pleasure and reward area. And the thing is, is that think about, you know, anytime a teen does something right, they want to be recognized and rewarded for it. If they're good at sports, they want to be recognized. If they get good grades in the report card, they want some sort of reward. So that pleasure and reward area is very active for them. But the problem is, is that teen brains don't register delayed um, gratification. So they vaguely register that there's going to be any kind of punishment later. Uh, for their actions because the appeal of the fun is just too strong for them. They want to do what feels good, what is fun to them. They don't think about, okay, if I do this, this is what's going to happen later. They're just acting in the moment. So they're very, um, they, they, they just operate on a very uh, focused uh, place. Like they just don't want to be in an area where they're not going to get recognized or rewarded right away. So the other thing that we see is there's more receptors for oxytocin that are being produced. And oxytocin is the relationship hormone. That's the bonding hormone. So that's the hormone that's released during sex. Um, so it's in teenagers, this is linked to a feeling of self-consciousness. So if they're not bonding with their peers, they are wondering what's wrong with me. Uh, you know, what, what can't, what am I not doing right? Why won't my peers be my friends? So that whole self-consciousness thing. And when we look at the loner capacity of these school shooters and we see that most of them are 15 years old is the average for these school shooters. Well, oxytocin that peaks at around 15 years of age. So if they're isolated, if they're not bonding, then they're more likely to respond to that. Um, so what a teen does and is exposed to during this time really impacts their future. So you have to really look at what they are exposing themselves to, what they're doing, um, because how they are going to be as an adult is really impacted by this. Teens are figuring out their own identity. And they're not turning to mom and dad to figure out who they're going to be and what they're going to do. They're looking at their peers. What do my peers think is cool? What do, you know, what's my best friend going to do with their life? They're, you know, and they're going to get feedback from their friends. This is what we're doing. Um, and so they're going to act on those feelings. Okay, it sounds fun to be an actor. I'm going to go to, you know, take the theater classes at college and not think about, okay, is this something that is really a good fit for you or is this something that is going to pay the bills? They're not thinking about that. They're thinking about what's fun. So they're looking at what their peers tell them is cool. The prefrontal cortex and the limbic system really don't come into balance until adulthood. So about mid-20s is when you start to see that alignment where they can think through their feelings and make decisions in a more logical manner. So the prefrontal cortex, why this is such a big deal and its development is so crucial is it's responsible for personality, so who they become. It also regulates their feelings and how they respond to things. It controls impulsiveness. So we know that teens want instant gratification. And so not having that prefrontal cortex feeds into why they, they do such impulsive and risky acts. It also determines their initiative. So you know, the lack of initiative may be due to not having that prefrontal cortex development. Their judgment and their logical decisions is also part of the prefrontal cortex, so they're not thinking logically and making good judgment calls. So the thing that we look at with teenagers is they're more likely to be emotional. And when they're emotional, because it is the limbic system and it's the emotional center of the brain, when they're upset, they are pouring out the tears. They're more emotional about things. And when they're angry, they're really angry. Um, so that emotional impact is there. They're also uh, very rebellious and risky. Uh, so they need higher doses of risk to fill the same rush that adults do. So you have these adults that, you know, like to do the extreme sports and they like to do things that are risk taking. And for a teen, they kind of have to up the ante to fill the same exact rush that adults would. Um, so that's why they tend to do things that were like, why in the world did you do that? <laughs> it's not the smartest decision. Uh, and that's tied to that, that need for that rush. Uh, so they are more impulsive, 
Um, and the thing that we see is if they're going to develop an addiction that carries in adulthood, it's going to develop more in the teen years. So if they're exposed to cigarettes, to drugs, alcohol, um, sex, those are all things that they're going to develop those addictions in the teen years, and it's going to carry into adulthood. Um, because those synapses of the brain, that's what the brain's going to take hold of is those addictive behaviors. And it's going to carry them into the permanent pathways that become part of the permanent personality. Uh, and they tend to get less sleep. Uh, we have a lot of high school tours that come through, and I'm always asking the teens, how much sleep are you getting? And they're very few are giving me an answer that they're getting the recommended amount of hours. So they tend to get less sleep. There's a lot more going on in their life. They experience a lot of social anxiety. They seek peer approval. Um, so they're, they're worried what their friends think, and they're going to behave in a way that they want to impress their friends. So how does sleep factor into all this? We know all these little social factors that are going on that teens are exposed to, but what's the sleep element in all of this? Well, I always like to, when we have high school tours here at the college, I always like to ask teenagers, how much sleep are you getting? And the teens that, when I pull them, I get anywhere from two hours of sleep per night to eight hours of sleep per night. Most of them are six hours or less. Uh, and so CDC, they reported on teen sleep in 2016, and they showed about 69% of high school students get less than the eight hours that's required um, on school nights. So they're not getting enough sleep. The National Sleep Foundation said that number was actually 87% in a 2006 poll. Um, so we're seeing a skew from that 2006 number to 2016. And some of the things that might factor into why the number may have gone down a little bit is some schools are actually starting later school times, uh, later start times. So we might see some areas where teens are actually getting better sleep. And it's interesting to look at statistics from COVID-19 and they show in those statistics that actually the age group that got an improvement in sleep and actually reported feeling more refreshed because they're getting enough sleep is the teen population. Uh, so we have to look at what is keeping our teens from sleeping. Number one thing is electronics these days. 97% uh, of teenagers have at least one electronic item and most have four to six. Uh, so, you know, you have the cell phones, you have the smartwatches, you have the tablets, you have the laptops. Uh, most teens have a TV in their bedroom. They've got, you know, the gaming systems. They have all these electronics that are at their disposal in their bedrooms. And they're operating against their circadian rhythm too because a lot of these schools are starting early in the morning and a lot of teenagers suffer from delayed sleep phase where it's hard for them to fall asleep before 11 or 12 o'clock at night and then they're expected to be at school by 7 30 or they have to do sports and warm-ups um, and exercises before school so these kids are just not getting enough hours to get the sufficient amount of sleep the other thing that we see is addictions. Uh, so they have addictions to their phones, to gaming, social media, TV. Uh, so, I mean, I'm see seeing even in small children that are addicted to having a tablet or a phone to play on. Um, and so in teens, you know, that addiction is something that if they have it in the teen years, they're probably going to carry it into their adulthood. Social events, um, you know, social events are kind of lessened right now with COVID going on, but Social events are another area when, you know, they can participate in things with their peers. They tend to do that versus sleep. And then homework, you know, they're doing all this fun stuff with their friends and, and you know, that reward center, they got to do stuff that makes them feel rewarded. They'll put homework off to the last minute. And so they'll pull all nighters or they'll work on their homework into the middle of the night and not put the emphasis on the sleep that they need. So sleep deprivation factors, we talked about the prefrontal cortex, it's underdeveloped in teens. And what you see with the prefrontal cortex is it really relies on sleep for efficient functioning. So if you are sleep deprived, um, it's very much like drinking alcohol. Your brain behaves the same way in sleep deprivation as it does with co consummation of alcohol. So, uh, or consumption of alcohol. So um, with alcohol, um, you know, we see with sleep deprivation, if you go 17 hours without sleep, it's like a blood alcohol level 0 0.05. If you go 24 hours without sleep, that's like a blood alcohol level of 0 0.10. So you see where these teens brains, you know, without sleep, 
without prefrontal cortex, you add all those things together and they're, they're behaving the same way as if they were, they were drunk. Um, and the thing is we have teens operating from the emotional center of the brain. If you're sleep deprived, it heightens emotional response. So you have a teen that's thinking from the emotional center, you factor in sleep deprivation, they're going to react a lot stronger to it, uh, something that triggers them. And they're also more prone to inappropriate behavior and paranoia. They're worried somebody's out to get them. They're going to do things with that risk-taking behavior that they normally would not do if a prefrontal cortex was giving them the logic behind it. They're more likely to battle depression and substance abuse. So what we see is each hour of sleep lost is associated with a 38% increased risk of feeling sad or hopeless and a 58% increase in suicide attempts in high school students. So if they're only getting four hours of sleep, it increases their risk that they're going to harm themselves or they're going to dive into depression. And research has shown that sleep difficulties predicted substance related issues because they're going to do things to help them stay awake. And what we see a lot in teens is overconsumption of these energy drinks. They're you know turning to the monsters and the Red Bulls and it's stuff that is their hearts are not designed to have that much caffeine and they will just chug those things and we've seen heart attacks in in teenagers as a result of use of uh, energy uh, drinks so those those uh other behaviors that we see you know they might do some binge drinking they might you know be more at risk for duis or risky sexual behaviors so they're doing things that you know normally they shouldn't be doing and those that sleep an average of six hours per night are three times more likely to suffer from depression. And we'll talk about how the sleep and depression kind of have this vicious cycle that's going on um, because of lack of sleep. They're also higher risk for diabetes and obesity in adulthood. We're seeing an increase in childhood obesity. Uh, and think about if you're not sleeping, what you need to operate you need energy to operate so what do you turn to if sleep is not the energy restorer you're going to turn to food so childhood obesity is on the rise we see a dependence on sleep and anxiety medications they can go into any drugstore and go and buy uh, melatonin melatonin is sold over the counter um, so you know they'll have to go and pop a melatonin if they want to go to sleep or you know they're going to um, you know, they're, they're more likely to be prescribed an, uh, antidepressants. And if they are uh, prescribed those, they're 12 times more likely to abuse those medications as well. And the other issue that we see with teens is that sleep deprivation doesn't appear as sleepiness in many of the cases. It actually appears more like they have ADHD because with kids, the sleep deprivation presents as hyperactivity rather than um, normal sleepiness. So we've seen an increase in ADHD cases in the digital age because they're not getting enough sleep, so they're, they're acting out and being hyperactive as a result of lack of sleep. So a lot of times they're just prescribed a medication. They're more likely to be inattentive, impulsive, hyperactive, and oppositional if they're not getting enough sleep. So it looks like they got ADHD, but a lot of these cases are actually not true ADHD cases. They're just sleep deprived. They're also more at risk for drowsy driving accidents. You know, you think about you've got a, an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex and you're asking them to make logical decisions with a motor vehicle and then they're tired on top of that. You know, they're more likely to fall asleep because they're not going to resist it. And then they're more likely to make poor decisions because they're tired as well. The less sleep that teens get, the higher the odds of risk-taking behaviors. And what we see, these risk-taking behaviors, they precede accidents, suicide, teen violence. So they're more likely to, you know, cut somebody off in traffic and get hit, uh, swerve in and out of traffic, go above the speed limit. So we see a lot of, you know, cases where they're doing these risk-taking behaviors and it led to a major accident. Or, you know, some of these risk-taking, you know, behaviors, if they have no desire to live, they're going to do stuff that might likely result in their death. Um, and then teen violence, they just don't care. So, you know, if they go and shoot somebody, they're not thinking about jail time. They're not thinking about, you know, potential consequences. They're thinking about, oh, I, you know, I just don't care. Um, so they're not thinking about long-term. It's instant gratification for them. Sleep amounts are usually less than six hours per night. 
Um, and this increases uh, mental health concerns because of depression, substance abuse, and motor vehicle crashes. The strongest associations that we see are related to mood and self-harm. So they're more likely to have issues where they're just not pleasant to be around, um, very um, frustrated with things. Uh, they're more likely to participate in self-harming behaviors like cutting, for example. Uh, so insufficient sleep really heightens some of the issues that we see with the teen brain to begin with. When we look at sleep in the school shooters at Columbine, um, Dylan Klebold's mother actually wrote a book, and she talked in her book that Dylan's sleep patterns changed prior to the Columbine shooting. She said he went from being an early riser to a late one, and she said he had a very short temper, and he was really withdrawn in the weeks and months leading up to Columbine shooting. Um, she reported he often appeared tired in the months that led up to it. Uh, his uh, calculus teacher told his parents that he sometimes fell asleep in class. Uh, he was very depressed uh, in the months leading up to the shooting. Um, and so depression really manifests itself differently in teens. Teens tend to be withdrawn, self-critical, frustrated, angry, um, and they may have unexplained pains, whininess, sleep disorders, and clinginess, uh, especially in younger kids. Uh, so changes in sleep can actually be a sign of uh, depression. And the other perpetrator, the main perpetrator behind Columbine was Eric Harris. And Eric Harris was actually taking Zoloft um, for, he had taken that actually for two months. Um, and his behaviors were so different with that medication. He soon became obsessed with homicidal and suicidal thoughts um, within weeks of taking that medication. And so because he was so obsessed with killing, his doctor switched him over to Luvox. Um, and the autopsy uh, after the shooting showed that he had Luvox in his system at the time of death. Um, Luvox is an SSRI, which is an antidepressant, and it's been shown to trigger uh, REM behavior disorder, actually, in younger patients. Typically, REM behavior disorder is more seen in males over the age of 65 as a precursor to, like, Parkinson's. It's not usually seen in younger patients, um, but this medication actually does trigger those episodes. It's often used to treat patients with OCD. Uh, so... Uh, Mark Taylor, who was actually the first uh, student that was actually shot at Columbine, he sued Solvay, which is the company that makes Luvox, uh, because he stated the Luvox likely caused Harris to become this manic, psychotic, and homicidal, suicidal person. Um, and the medication had actually brought about emotional blunting um, or a lack of inhibition. Um, and so... The, they felt that this medication really was a contributing factor for his actions that day at Columbine. And Eric Harris also had a nightmare three times about killing the kids at school before he ever committed Columbine. So this was told to his parents as therapist. Um, so this was something that people were aware of prior to Columbine, but they never did anything about it. And they had him on a medication that was made him more prone to do these acts. The other thing that they found in the autopsy is that both shooters' brains were found to be awash in serotonin. Uh, serotonin causes violence, aggression, and it can trigger sleepwalking. And so, you know, the fact that they had that much anger in their system, that much serotonin, um, was also another very interesting thing about their behaviors. So did the sleep changes trigger Klebold's depression? Um, so according to Principles and Practice of Sleep Medicine, 6th edition, sleep disturbance is now thought to play an important causal role in the onset and maintenance of many cases of major depression. Insomnia often precedes the onset of the first episode of major depression, and persistence of sleep disturbances has been shown to predict increased severity and recurrence of major depression. And so with teens, if they don't get enough sleep, they're four times more likely to develop major depression. And if depression goes and manifests, if they're depressed, they're four times more likely to lose sleep. And so losing sleep propels the depression, the depression propels the lack of sleep. So what we saw in Klebold's behaviors prior to the shooting was that he was spending a lot more time on the computer and staying up all night playing video games in those months prior to the shooting. So you know, was the lack of sleep what caused him to be depressed? And because he was depressed, was he spending more time on the computer? 
this is interesting facts that we look at in this, this case. But teens are a high risk group for depression. Um, so they're not getting enough sleep because they're dealing with things like homework, social activities, after school jobs, delayed sleep phase, technology addictions. And most times they get prescribed antidepressants um, and the antidepressants will further complicate their sleep problems. So they, there's just this vicious cycle that's going on um, trying to treat these, these cases. So how has technology impacted teen sleep? If they have four or more devices, they're twice as likely to fall asleep in school. And we know that technology has become the main source of teen entertainment. You know, teens will go and, and close themselves in their room, watch TV, play games on their computers, their tablets, their phones. Um, and tech addiction has been a very big problem in the teen population. And most of these tech devices are housed in the teen's bedroom. So because all of this technology is there to keep them from sleeping, the bedroom's no longer the sleep zone. And so they're not getting quality sleep when they're in there. They're worried about, did I miss a text? Did I, you know, is something going on with my game, you know, with the other players in the game? They're so worried about these things that are happening on their devices that they're not getting quality sleep even when they do sleep. A study of 125,000 kids show a strong and consistent association between bedtime media device use and inadequate sleep quantity, poor sleep quality, and excessive daytime sleepiness. So we see, if we look back to the trend line in the earlier slide that I presented, um, if you look at the trend line, really when technology and the availability of portable electronics really hit its peak, that's when we started to see this major rise in school shootings. And they're spending a lot more time on social media. So social media also impacts the way that the teens are thinking because they're thinking with emotion. So why aren't we dealing with sleep deprivation effectively? Problem is, part of it is the education. Parents don't know what to look for, teachers don't know what to look for, and school administrators don't understand how this lack of sleep is factoring into the behaviors they're seeing in their students. And because teen sleep deprivation can look so different from adults, the signs may get missed. You know, sometimes teens are falling asleep in class, but sometimes they're acting out, they're carrying on, they're doing behaviors to get attention because they're just so sleepy. So how do we change the statistics? The big thing is we have to educate the major stakeholders. We have to provide them with sleep education to parents, to school administrators, to teachers, and educating the teens themselves. I go into a lot of high schools and talk to teens in health science programs and talk to them about the importance of sleep and what's happening to their body when they don't get enough sleep. And their eyes are just majorly open because they just don't understand what they're doing. Um, and so sometimes that helps to change the behaviors, but you have to have all the stakeholders working together to really affect change. The other thing is, is to watch for and respond to abnormal behaviors. You know, you're going to see often it's the sleep behaviors that change first. Um, so look at those sleep behaviors. Look at what they're um, doing. Keep in mind that most of these shooters exhibited warning signs ahead of the act. It wasn't a random act. And so ig ignorance of these behaviors is really what factored into some of these cases. So don't ignore the behaviors. Work with these teens. Monitor what they're doing electronically. What are they exposing themselves to? Is it appropriate materials? Is it things that are going to be detrimental to their, their behavioral development? And help them to develop healthy habits. Help them to do things that are productive that will help them uh, in the long run, help them in their adulthood years. Um, so what they're doing now in the teen years really is gonna shape them for the rest of their lives. So in conclusion, sleep deprivation is a growing problem. We see with the rise of technology, we see with everything that teens are dealing with, that, that sleep is not a priority. And because it's not a priority, it is factoring into the behaviors that we see. Uh, school shooters have shown sleep disruptions in the months prior to the school shootings, showing that sleep issues can be a contributing factor. So looking at those behaviors, dealing with those, can we prevent you know, potential de depression by getting them better sleep? That's a possibility. So we really need to look at what they're doing in those sleep behaviors and work with um, our teens to make sure that they're getting the sleep they need. 
electronic availability is a contributing factor to team sleep deprivation. So we need to look at ways to keep electronics out of the bedroom. You know, maybe parents lock them up uh, at night so the teens sleep. There has to be a solution that has to be in play to get teens to get better quality sleep and better quantity of sleep as well. So education is really a big key thing. And as sleep technologists, um, you want to go out and educate uh, in your communities, let people know, here's what's going on, you know, with teen sleep and how can we make this better? So if we educate all the important stakeholders, we're more likely to see some change. So here are on um, the next several slides are my resources. So this is where I got my information and I will take some questions. Good afternoon, and we want to extend a warm welcome and thank you to Amber Allen for joining us for this live Q&A session today. Amber, thank, thank you for your lecture and joining us this afternoon. Thank you. You're welcome. During your lecture, we compiled a list of questions, and I'm going to ask them to you if you are ready. Okay. Excellent. First one, question is, any data that correlates ADHD and school shootings? I have not seen anything in the data that I researched on the ADHD and school shooting correlation. I do know that sleep deprivation is being wrongly diagnosed as ADHD, and some of these cases, even the ones that were put on antidepressants, um, may have been a sleep deprivation case rather than needing to be on those medications. So um, I think some of it is the push to go on a medication rather than looking at the behaviors and trying to correct the behaviors in a non-pharmacology way. Excellent, thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. Next question, you'd mentioned Columbine as, was a catalyst, but sleep depri deprivation was an issue prior. What else changed? Well, I, sleep deprivation has been a problem for a long time, but the amount of sleep I think really has taken a downward turn with the electronics because looking at the amount of sleep that a lot of these teens are getting, they're getting a lot less hours than even prior to Columbine. So mm. more with the electronic use and kind of this electronics addictions that are taking place, mm -hmm. it's really made the sleep quantity go down, um, that we're seeing a greater impact. And they're also, there's a lot less censorship in the electronic media that the teens are being exposed to. So they're seeing more violence. They're seeing more things that they shouldn't really be seeing at that age um, that are propelling behaviors and trying to do things that are like what they're seeing on their, their video games and on their movies and on their TV. Very interesting and a very good segue to our next question. What are a couple of new ways that we can incorporate, incorporate sleep education in that, with adolescents? I think the big thing is to reach out, start reaching out to the school guidance counselors um, to come into the schools and talk to the teachers and then talk to the students themselves about sleep. Because one of the ways that I've gotten into a lot of the high schools that I've spoken at is by talking to teachers and telling them all these statistics about teen sleep. And they're like, can you come talk to my students? Because I think if they hear this from an expert, then they're going to take it more to heart because we've been telling them they need more sleep, they need more sleep. But I think they need somebody that has that little legitimacy that they will take it more seriously. And so when I come in and talk to the teens, they don't realize the damage they're doing. They don't realize the impact they're having on their learning, on their relationships, on their preparing for adulthood. Um, and so when you talk to them and they see it from a expert size, mm -hmm. they tend to take it a little bit more seriously and start looking at their behaviors. Um, and we've also done um, projects with the schools to have their students take and compile a sleep diary to really take a look, hard look at their sleep and then talk about those sleep diaries with the students and say, hey, you notice this trend. What if we try this? See what that does for your sleep. And we've been even doing that at the community college level, um, working with students, getting them to compile their sleep diaries and then changing their behaviors. And they've actually seen better test scores um, in the classes that we worked in conjunction with. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, the next question, it was related to blue light. We know blue light is not healthy, but does blue light device or does blue light from devices correlate to abnormal EEG behavior? Um, it does affect as far as melatonin production. So it will cause sleep to be more fragmented. Um, so it can affect sleep architecture. 
Um, but as far as EEG, um, I'm not sure on that, but I do know that it affects the architecture. Excellent. We're, we have about a minute left, so if you have any additional questions that you would like to submit, please, by all means, submit them in the chat. Um, one just popped up. In looking at adolescent sleep behavior and development, should there be additional sleep education at the school age? What, what age do you think we should begin talking about this? I think it should be even from brand new parents, um, understanding newborn sleep on up. Um, because a lot of parents don't understand that, you know, the baby needs to sleep 18 hours a day. That is normal. Um, and a lot of the school age kids are not getting enough sleep because they need to have, you know, over 10 hours of sleep. Um, and a lot of parents I hear, you know, are putting kids to bed at 10, 11 o'clock at night at school age and they need to be going to bed earlier. So I think education needs to start from, from babies on up. Um, and if the parents understand that, then we may see a change in trends and behaviors. Well, thank you so much, Amber, for joining us today and participating in our annual event. On behalf of Medical Service Company, we appreciate you. Um, thank you please, for having me. Oh, you're welcome. If you have any questions, please feel free again to submit them in the chat, but please complete your evaluation and submit it for your credit. And then the next track will take place in just a moment. Thanks for joining us.